This episode is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your Raspberry Pi with our all-in-one arcade kit using genuine Sanwa arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. Hello cave dwellers, welcome to the cave. Today we've got a real treat for you. It's a flight of really rare British micros to whet your appetite. We're going to take a quick look at all of them and perhaps if there's anything you see that you want to see more in depth, then we can do that in a future episode. And when I say we, we're joined today by Keith from the Digital Orphanage. Hello, Neil. Hello, Keith. Thank you for joining us. Where did these machines come from today? Uh, well, Neil, these machines came from the Museum of Computing in Swindon and uh, um, they didn't come from display. I went down into the uh, into the stalls and, and found some that we could look at today. Right, so you had to blow a little bit of dust off of a few of them, did you? A little bit of dust, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, we've got a lot of machines to cover today, so we're going to grab the first one now. And what we'll do is we'll give you a little voiceover to give you uh, all the facts, a fact attack if you like, and some sexy shots. And then we'll give you our feedback. And in many cases here, it's going to be our, um, our first impressions because mm -hmm. our families, I think it's fair to say, made um, normal choices? <laughs> well, they made more sensible choices, yes. So we had things like the Amstrads and the Spectrums and the Commodores back in the day, not these machines. So it's really going to be fascinating to get our hands on these and have a look at them. Let's grab the first machine if you don't mind, Keith. Our first micro is the Memotech MTX512. This was the creation of Robert Branton and Jeff Boyd who met in Oxford, which alongside Cambridge was a melting pot of technology ideas and spawned many computer startups in the 80s. Memotech built its war chest making peripherals for the Sinclair ZX81, memory expansions were particularly popular. But when Sinclair started releasing machines with more RAM on board, they turned their attention to building their own micro, which released in 1983. And what a looker it is. Brushed aluminium is the order of the day and it looks as good today as it did 37 years ago. If you think it looks familiar and you're not sure why, it's the machine that was used in the movie Weird Science to hack into the Pentagon. Inside the 512 we find 64K of RAM, the lesser MTX500 has 32K as standard which could be extended to a whopping 768K and there's 24K of ROM. The CPU is a Zilog Z80A running at 4 MHz and dedicated chips for video and sound by Texas Instruments complete a spec that's not dissimilar to the MSX standard of micros which appeared in this year. Ports are plentiful, including various video outputs, a cassette port, two joystick ports, parallel ports and a cartridge slot on the side, with space internally for an optional communications board for two RS-232 interfaces and a disk drive bus. So here it is, the Memotech MTX512. Um, my first impression is that this is a weighty, beautiful looking machine with that brushed aluminium. Mm. Do you like the style? I do. It's something that, I mean, it's what, 30 odd years old and it still looks brand new. Yeah. No, no retro biting needed here. Yeah, yeah, it does look mint, doesn't it? And I don't think any special care or attention has had to be taken to keep it in that, no. that way. Um, I'd like to think that BA Barackers would sit down and use this. It's definitely got the A-team stripe along it, hasn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's an influence there. Um, and just the way it's labelled, if we look on the back, um, it's not UHF or anything like that. It's monitor out. It's, it's not audio. It's hi-fi. It's everything is designed to kind of look a bit more premium mm. than, say, its competition a ZX Spectrum, and it does sit, that's why we've got the BBC Micro over here, in terms of performance and price, it really does sit between the two, doesn't it? It's got the uh, sort of premium feel that B the BBC had. You could do some damage with that. Um, mm. Now there's an interesting story behind this because the British government did invest a million pounds um, into Memotech to help with the development of this machine, and it failed, which is why it's a lesser known machine, it flopped. And as a result of that failure, the British government then pulled out completely any future funding to Sinclair, to Acorn, to anyone else. They just said, we've had enough of microcomputers. So um, this could be to blame for the end of British investment <laughs> in microcomputers. That's a hell of a legacy to leave. What, what could it? have been? <laughs> what could have been? been? But yeah, it's a lovely machine. Mm -hmm. um, and that is one that I would love to add to my collection. So if you like the look of this machine, do you want to see a full episode on this? Let us know in the comments. I want to see one. <laughs> Should we look at the next micro, Keith? We shall, yes. Okay.
The Auric 1. This is one of three machines that use the Auric name, branding used by Tangerine computer systems for their home micro range, the catalyst for which, like most, was the success of Sinclair's computers. They wanted a piece of the action and shared their machine with the world in 1982. Like Sinclair's computers, it's clearly built to a tight budget with a chiclet keyboard, a simple moulded plastic design and a few ports on the rear. They're for the cassette tape, there's a printer port, RF out and an expansion port, but rather nicely also there's an RGB video output. Looks can be deceptive, the keyboard overhangs the size of the system board, which is evident when we turn it over and see a speaker grill which emitted sound generated by an AY sound chip, and that's a point scored over the original ZX Spectrum design. The AY chip was added to that range later in its life. Inside we find the other popular CPU of the 80s, the MOS Technologies 6502A, running at 1MHz as found in the BBC Micro, Commodore 64 and many others. Two models of the Auric 1 were available, one with 16K and the other with 48K of RAM, and both had 16K of ROM which housed a Microsoft flavoured basic. Mine is the final issue full board produced and the ROM comprises of two ICs with Mitsubishi branded labels on them. Do take note of that for the next machine that we'll be looking at. It's compact, neat and nicely laid out, as you'd expect from a company with the experience of Tangerine, but was it actually any good? So when it comes to the Auric 1, I'm actually lucky enough to have my own boxed one here. It's not bad condition. Do you remember seeing this box on the shelves? Because I certainly don't. It was a bit before my shopping time. No. No, no. no. It's, it's a nice box. It's nicely presented. What does it offer us? What's it promising us there? Well, it's promising not just ordinary styling, but superb styling. Superb styling. Superb styling, yes. Full graphics and real sound. And teletext. <laughs> And teletext. And teletext. <laughs> yes, teletext and view data. And a professional keyboard. Now I'm dubious about the professional keyboard just from looking at the picture of it. So let's get it out of the box, mm. Keith, and we'll have a look. There it is. So this would have cost you £129 for a 16K version, um, £169 for a 48K version. So similar kind of setup as the 16 or 48K Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Again, this, this will keep coming up because it was so popular. This was the one that set the trend, wasn't it? You had the ZX80 and the 81, and then things exploded with the ZX Spectrum um, in terms of sales and sometimes technically. Um, <laughs> so the Auric 1 was made by a company called Tangerine, and they had a machine going back to 1979 with the Microtan. Shall we try and put it down without squeaking and annoying everyone with the polystyrene? There yes. we go. Sorry, everyone's ears. Um, and uh, Tangerine put out the Microtan, that was a self-build computer in 1979, 6502-based, I think it was. So they had experience and they were watching from the sidelines and they saw the sales of the Sinclair ZX Spectrum and just had to bring out a machine themselves. And here it is. Um, the first thing that really strikes me, Keith, is whenever I saw pictures of this, I always assumed it was the same size as a ZX Spectrum. Hmm. It it's, does, it's on a, all the photos, because there's nothing else to scale. No, so if you put that next to the ZX Spectrum, you can see that it's actually, squeaky polystyrene, um, it's actually quite quite a lot bigger, isn't it? Hmm, let's put it there. There you, you go. go. Yeah, it's much bigger, which means that um, although it's this kind of spongy, horrible chiclet keyboard, there's more room uh, and less room for error. There's more room for your fingers, less room for error compared to the dead flesh of the ZX Spectrum. It's still a horrible keyboard, let's be honest, but, <laughs> but it's less like, horrible. Yeah, I'm not sure I'd like these small, thin, yeah. Yeah. Was it successful anywhere? Well, they did sell quite a few in the UK for a short period of time, and they sold, uh, I think, something like 50,000 in France, and, and that was apparently for a short space of time the most popular one in France. Oh, really? But, okay. Because the French, in the 8-bit era, they really took to the Amstrad, didn't they? the Amstrad range of computers, so they sold really well. Um, mm. I do know for a fact that um, Francois Lionet, the designer and programmer behind STOS and AMOS, you may have heard of those programs, um, when I interviewed him, and it was the first computer that he had a game published on, a game called Driver, so it brought oh, him cool. some success. And he raves about it, he loves the Auric one. So um, there are some fans out there of the machine. Now it's well known that it was bought out specifically to compete with the ZX Spectrum. Mm -hmm. Are there any other improvements that it has over the Speccy. It's got better sound, so it's got stereo sound, and I believe it's the same chip as in our beloved Amstrad CPC. The AY chip, so it actually has a sound chip compared to the mm. Speccy's beeper, although the later 
uh, Spectrums did have a sound chip. Um, any other differences? It's a different CPU, isn't it? It's um, 6502 mm -hmm. running at 1 megahertz compared to the 3.5 megahertz Z80. Uh, different processors, so mm -hmm. it's hard to give a direct comparison on megahertz alone. There's a lot of things I've read which said that the 6502 was a faster processor than the Z80. Per so, clock cycle, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I imagine they would have had pretty similar performance just based on the CPU yeah. alone. Um, and then, of course, the Speccy was famous for its color clash. Did mm. we have the same problem on the Auric? Yes, but to a lesser degree. Right. Uh, it, instead of an 8x8 grid of pixels that you can have your colors in, it's got a 6x1. Right, OK. So the color clash, the attribute clash was still there. I think it had two resolutions as well, a higher a text only and a higher resolution. Yes, so in that high res is the one that's got the 6x1. Yeah. So there we go, that's the Auric one. Um, it's, it's less sexy than the uh, MTX, isn't it? I think we're going to struggle to find a better looking computer mm. than the MTX today. But it's got its own charm. You know, I can see if we compare it to um, another French computer over here. Sorry, this is not a French computer. <laughs> it's not a French computer. <laughs> another, another computer that was popular in France. <laughs> but it's got its own charm. If we compare it to another computer from France, um, targeting the French market specifically in lipstick red, mm. um, you know, it's got it's got a kind of nice styling. I can see why the French would take to the styling if they took to this. If this was what French computing was all about in the 80s, then um, I can see why they might like the Auric one. And it's got a strange sort of overhang effect. So the actual computer part is probably around the same size as the Spectrum. It is actually, isn't it? There you go, kind of about the same size. And then they've thought about the ergonomics of it by making it a wedge shape mm. so that the keyboard is slightly at a slant. That's nice. Right, uh, the Oric story doesn't stop here because although this didn't sell wildly, it was successful enough to um, attract investment mm -hmm. uh, to Tangerine and to um, get them to build another computer, which is the next one we're going to look at now. So let's put this away and grab the next machine. The Auric Atmos arrived in 1984. It's that difficult second album for the band who wanted to build on its modest success. On the face of it, it's a promising start. A good-looking and usable keyboard replaces the chiclet keys and the colour scheme is really very attractive. That wedge shape and compact 57-key keyboard with no numeric keypad kind of reminds me of an Amiga 600. When using BASIC, this keyboard can type full commands at the touch of a single key, just like in Sinclair's BASIC, but this can also be disabled so you can type everything in full, which is my preference, I have to say. And there's a false speaker grill on the top of the case, and apparently this is where the redesigned board would see the speaker relocated to, but that just didn't happen. Why not? Well, let's look inside and we'll see what vast improvements have been made over the Auric 1 in this, the Atmos. Yes, that's right. Absolutely nothing has changed. In fact, this is an issue 3 board, which is an earlier revision than the board I had in my Auric 1. The spec is the same. It's the same damn machine. There are some minor differences though. Our two ROM chips have been consolidated into one, and that ROM is a version 1.1 ROM which squashes various bugs that were found in the original ROM and adds some new commands. It is entirely possible to add this ROM to your Auric 1, but the differences in the ROMs does break compatibility with some programs, so a ROM switcher was sometimes installed by enthusiasts. Later titles would have software for the 1.0 ROM on one side of the tape and 1.1 on the other to simplify things. The Atmos then was less of a new computer and more of a tweak to bring out the best in the machine. So here's our next machine and um, I was dwelling a little bit on the styling of the last one and, and showing you this French one because I think that perhaps they were influenced by that little bit of success they had in the French mm. market and you can see it in the design of the follow-up, the Auric Atmos. You've got these We've gone to a black shell with red keys and red trim and styling. I think it looks actually quite a lot better than the original Auric one. Mm. Um, and they've done away with all the claims on this box. It's not telling us it's real sound and full graphics. Um, it's just showing the machine itself. And I think that works. I think it does too. And there's an interesting label over there. What's that all about? So, in fact, there's two labels. Quite confusing because it says it's got 48K, mm -hmm. which is the same as the Auric one. But they also make a big thing about contain 64K of RAM. Okay. And apparently that's because in both of these, they found it easier to put uh, 8 8K 
RAM chips. Right. One RAM chip for each of the uh, data lines. Um, but because there's only 64K addressable and the ROM's got to take up some of that room, that they just drop 16K and use the ROM in place. Um, should we pop it out of the box and mm. have a look at it? More squeaking. <laughs> And there it is, and you can see that's actually in mint condition because it's still got this protective film oh, on there. That's there lovely. are so many people that would just like to <laughs> just to peel just that to off. Peel that off. Should we do it? No, <laughs> no. no lovely it. looking machine. So size wise, it's the same. It's exactly I, I the think same it's, size. I think it's come out of the same molds, same uh, kind of wedge on the bottom. Is it even got the same printing? No, no. Not, so the, the top same. is different, but but the bottom, yeah, look, you can see it's an identical machine underneath. So same, um, same mold. And at the back, the same ports, exactly the same ports. So they've just changed the top half mm -hmm. to give it a proper keyboard, which I applaud. I think that's nice. I think that's a really good looking machine. If I bought this, would I have been disappointed if I already owned an Auric one? The upgraded ROM in this one was made available to drop into here. Right. But you'd have to fit a switch so that you could flip between them because the software would, would have been different. Right, so the hardware was that similar that you could mm -hmm. just put the uh, the Atmos ROM into the Auric one. Same CPU, same RAM, mm -hmm. just and the, the same machine there. Yeah, and then when you bought the games on cassette, on one side would be the Atmos version and right. the other one would be the Auric one right. version. But, you know, you could put the same ROM chip in there and just flick between them. Yeah. So I think I would have been disappointed. <laughs> I, 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 I would have wanted, have. I mean, the keyboard. I would have wanted here. that for yes. the keyboard, but... Um, you know, I would have been disappointed if I'd gone out and spent a, a lot of money again for what is essentially a keyboard upgrade. A bit like 664 owners, maybe? I wonder if you could take the top off and put it onto the... <laughs> 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 have that keyboard. And there's also a switch in the box. What's that all about? Yes, this caught my eye. This obviously didn't come with it. And I'm wondering whether uh, maybe Howard from Dubious Engineering... <laughs> it does look dubious. Uh, <laughs> somebody thought, I need a switch. Oh, that's attached to the power yeah. supply brick here. So they've made their own on-off switch. They, they've made their own. Because there's nothing on the there's, machine itself. As with many of these at the time, there was no on-off switch. You just pulled the plug out yeah. or switched it off at the wall. But somebody's decided. That's nice because it's, it, it shows that the machine was clearly used, even though it's got the protective film on. So they've, they've looked after <laughs> it very well. Good. Well, that's the, uh, the Auric journey. Um, where should we go next? I think, I think we'll grab something else from the pile. Um, I feel Sinclair. Sinclair, okay. Mm. Let's go with the Sinclair machine next. Let's see what we've got. Now this really is a standout machine in the history of home micros. Not for its performance or its build quality, but for its price. A sub 100 pounds or 200 US dollars microcomputer in January 1980. And if you had a soldering iron, you were looking at just £79.95 for the kit. We are an awfully long way from that metal case of the MTX machine now. A plastic case with plastic rivets and a membrane keyboard. It would get damaged, it would overheat and it could be unreliable. But it was under £100. At its heart is a Z80 CPU running at 3.25 MHz, just 1K of RAM, which is where Memotech saw that gap in the market for RAM expansions, and, well, very little else. The RAM doubled as video memory, yes 1K for your programs and display, which was black and white and character based. The minimal video circuitry meant a picture was only updated when the machine was idling, so it would flash when the CPU was doing something else, like registering a key press. But did I mention it was cheap? And that CPU was quite fast compared to the competition. With 50,000 sales, it woke an industry up in the UK and lit the touch paper of home computer ownership on our shores. OK, so admittedly, this is not as rare as some of the other computers we're looking at. Um, it's certainly old. It dates back to 1980. Mm -hmm. This is the ZX80, if you want to take it out of its squeaky box. And I, I love just how some of the computers come to us in the museum, as you can see, handwritten. <laughs> Definitely a Computer. Z80 in there. <laughs> um, and uh, although it's not as rare, it's a really important machine in the history of computing, isn't it? Or of British computing. Um, it's the machine that Sir Clive Sinclair really uh, used to drive down price and, and make it affordable. Um, can you remember how much this one cost? Uh, this was about £80 as a kit. Right, OK. Could you buy it pre-built? I think you, you could. could, yes. But um, a lot of people were still buying machines as kits then. And uh, it was it was 
almost debatable um, as to whether it should be called a computer or not at the time um, internally. Uh, this is what I've read from what, what the team were discussing because it couldn't perform floating point computations. Ah, okay. It wasn't until the later, the follow up the next year, the ZX81, that uh, that was really high on the priority for it to be able to do floating point calculations. Um, but I disagree. It is a computer through and through. They're, they're, they're very <laughs> similar machines, and the floating point was in the ROM anyway, so you could add that back. Um, the styling. Tell us about the styling, Keith, because there's an interesting feature you mentioned earlier on the top there. So I had a ZX81, and that was my introduction to computers. And because I had the magazines, I always used to see this as well. Uh, and I always used to think that this was a nice little exhaust port on the top with a nice grill. Uh, and <laughs> it's just it's, a sticker. Painted on. <laughs> it's painted on. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing that strikes me about this is just how fragile it looks. Mm. It's so thin. It's like if you stepped on that, you just snap the keyboard off. Um, a keyboard that is effectively a sticker it's actually peeling at the edge there, uh, and then a little... Oh, well, the, in the interesting thing is, is this is all part of the same circuit board. Right. So the keyboard is membrane, is on the circuit board that the rest of the computer's on, and then you've just got this lid, effectively, with these plastic... Um, fins? <laughs> Go well, faster fins? Yeah, it's, it's just, just <laughs> squashed together. and little plastic with, rivets in with there. With rivets. You can take those off yeah. so you can get inside. Uh, but it, it does have a very cheap feel to it. Mm. And uh, the competition at the time in terms of kit and pre-built machines that were coming out in 1980, the, the big one that came out to compete with it was the Acorn um, Atom, which we talked about recently in the BBC Micro series. And you'll see the styling of this. It's not quite as big, but it's a very similar industrial design to the um, BBC Micro. Uh, and it's got a proper keyboard on it. Mm. You can see the lineage between that and the later micro and the micro um, and indeed with that with the zx80 we went to the zx81 um, we i often mention the horrible dead flesh keyboard on the zx sinclair zx spectrum but it's amazing in comparison to this i, I, I used to type on this and and i had the additional overlay uh, but you could buy complete kits to put the whole of this into a completely different you know with a proper keyboard and everything yeah. but yeah but everything Everything about these was all about driving down price. Mm -hmm. um, it's evident in the styling, but as a result of that, it's quite iconic in its styling. There's almost an element of like retro futurism about it, isn't there? Yes, it, um, it's almost uh, Kubrick, almost mm. like 2001. Uh, and I wish I'd been able to get the one out of the display cabinet because that's a nice white version. Yeah, this is yellowed. Yeah, you can get an idea of what it should look like underneath. Mm. But... There you go, for a lot of us here. Uh, that is where it started. Not a rare machine, but a really important machine. Uh, but the next machine we're going to go to now is certainly one that you don't see very much of. The only one I've ever seen before is behind a glass cabinet. So now I get to get my hands on it. So let's have a look at the next machine, Keith. It's the turn now of the Enterprise 128, which hit shops in 1985. But it was announced two years earlier in 83, and that's a lifetime in technology terms. It came in two flavours, the Enterprise 64 and 128 with 64 and 128K of RAM respectively. The rest was the same, including the colourful styling and that unmissable built-in joystick. A balance of features and cost cutting has been struck with a wealth of expansion holes rather than ports because most of the time they're just exposing the system board. And the keyboard and case plastics are very Goldilocks. Not too cheap, not too fancy, but the overall look is very pleasing with a hint of Amstrad in the colour scheme and the quality is not too bad. Its standout features are that whopping 128K of RAM, or it would have been if released in 1983, and a 4MHz Z80 CPU supported by ASIC chips. Nick handled graphics and Dave the sound and memory bank switching to allow that Z80 to access the full 128K. The custom chips offered a range of video modes with up to 256 colours which could be mixed and display multiple resolutions and palettes on different parts of the screen at once. And that sound chip was pretty good with three channels and a noise channel and effects such as ring modulation also seen in the famous SID chip on the C64. Overall, this looks to be a very capable all-rounder with some really nice features. Okay, Keith, this is our final machine for the day. What have you got for us? Well, Captain, we've got the Enterprise. <laughs> the Enterprise, <laughs> beam me up. Um, 
It, the first impression that I get, the first thing that I think about is Amstrad CPC because of the colouring ah. of the keys. A quick glance, the green, the blue, the yeah, red, yeah. It, it's, it's all the same. And then the second thing you notice is it's got a joystick built into the damn case. <laughs> a joystick or a gear stick? Or a yeah, gear it stick. It looks a bit like a gear stick. Yeah. So that is where your cursor keys would normally be. So that's replacing the cursor keys. Now we've got to talk about the spec of this machine because if it had come out in 1983 when it was announced, it would have been a beast. And it was still pretty powerful when it came out in 1985. Mm. Um, and that was down to the fact that it used custom ASIC chips to offload certain um, features from the CPU, for example, the video and the sound chip, which was called Dave, brilliantly. <laughs> it's up there with Gary and the Amiga. Um, but to, just tell us about the basic specs. What do we have in here? Came in two models, got 64K model and a 128K, mm -hmm. uh, and it's got a 4 megahertz Z80. A. So a little bit faster than the ZX Spectrum, mm. half a megahertz, um, and a, quite a lot of RAM. 1985, I guess uh, the Amstrad CPC 6128 was coming out by then with 128K mm -hmm. of RAM. It was. So again, if it was 1983, it would have been a monster. Mm. Um, but uh, I like the style of it, and it's got some nice. Um, outputs on the back, inputs and outputs. Um, some of them are a little bit cheaply done. They've opted for exposing uh, the, the board rather than... Is that any different to the Amstrad? Itself. No, and, and, and you've got things like the um, expansion socket on the, on the Speccy is just a board that you plug things into. But despite the cheapness of the sockets, you have got... Um, I think there's a monitor output there somewhere, isn't there? There's RGB out somewhere here. One of the yeah. edge connectors here. Oh, um, there it is. There it is. So you've got RGB out, you've got a couple of joysticks, printer, serial port, two cassette interfaces, um, and an RF output uh, with a channel switcher, which I don't know if that's supposed to be stuck in or if that was for the American market. Um, but uh, it certainly gives you plenty of options. It's even got, is that a power switch? No, it's a reset switch yeah. there on the back. ROM slot. ROM slot. And then an expansion bay on the side that yeah. you could then. Increase your girth, Neil. <laughs> Increase your girth. Who doesn't want to do that? Um, and then the function keys could obviously be customised their use. They're just named function one to eight mm. with a little, uh, a little flip up, little flap where you could put your, yeah, I don't know if you're doing a flight sim or a word processor. What do you like do. flight sims? Have I mentioned I like flight sims, Keith? <laughs> you might have. You, might have. <laughs> you, oh, you did love the times. joystick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure about that. that. I think that has got to be a weak point. I think I would have snapped that in a day. Um, <laughs> Pull up, pull up. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's a really nice machine. Uh, serial number 1604 of 80,000, which sold. Um, and when the writing was on the wall, I think the last 20,000 went to Hungary. So. You, you could imagine just what it would have been like in the boardroom when Amstrad released the 464 and, uh, and, and the 6128. You know, they stole their march. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the 464 cost less, came with a monitor had a built-in cassette deck, so um, it kind of rendered this mm. redundant for all of its extra fancy chips that it had going on in there. Um, I don't think it ever really took hold, so that certainly is one of the rarer British micros, uh, and a very distinctive one at that. I like the look of it. So I hope you enjoyed our whistle-stop tour of uh, rare, some not so rare, but mm. interesting. I think they're all really interesting. British micros which may have not have been seen in other parts of the world. Um, I'm going to pick out a favourite and it's the one we saw at the very start based on styling alone. It's got to be the MTX 512 for me. Styling, weight, self-defence capabilities. It's, it's a lovely machine. I've got to get one for the cave. Um, I imagine if I find one the postage cost alone will probably exceed the price of the machine. Um, well, they, they do go for a lot of money actually. I've seen them up around £500 on eBay. Seriously? Wow. A lot of money. Um, how about you? Is there one that stands up for you? Uh, well, I do like this one as well, but I think I'm going to go with the Enterprise. The Enterprise, good choice, good choice, Captain. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I hope you've enjoyed looking at them. If there's anything you want to see more of, then do let us know in the comments section and we can make that happen either here or on Keith's channel, who I recommend you go and subscribe to. He's closing in on a thousand subscribers, so let's try and make that happen for Keith. And of course, uh, a mention to the Swindon Museum of Computing, who have been kind enough to lend us these machines. I'll put a link to their website down below um, and their social media and everything else. And do, if you're ever in the area, go and check out their museum. 
And I'd just say there's one gap that I'd love to see filled here and in my own collection. An honorable mention has to go to the Sam Coupe computer, which I know they've got at the museum, mm -hmm. but it's on display uh, and people are looking at it. We couldn't take it away today. So hopefully one day uh, we'll get a Sam Coupe. Here I was tempted. At. I was tempted. Yeah. Lovely, lovely machine. So we'll look at that in the future. But uh, as always, thank you, Keith, for coming to join us. Thank you, everyone, for watching and take care. Bye bye. If you enjoy my content and would like to support The Cave while receiving a completely ad-free experience and access to releases one week before they go public, then visit patreon.com forward slash retro man cave and join the official cave dwellers. Thank you for your support.